I know, I know, why have I not posted a video in almost two and a half months, but I've been very busy and this cold weather has been kicking my ass and even right now it kind of sounds raspy, but two, three weeks ago there was no way I was going to record this. But I can't hold this off any longer and my voice is probably not going to sound any better within the next month, so uh, let's get right into it because I want to make this intro a lot quicker than the other ones because season three is a lot to take in in this video. It, it's gonna be a long one i'm sorry guys so if you haven't seen my seasons one and two recaps they will be linked in this video and the description of this video but the only thing i want to clarify before is whenever it comes to what happened to flight 828 and all the theories behind it that will be an in-depth separate video after this one about alzuris the callings everything these videos are simply full recaps of the show but we still briefly touch on some of the clues throughout and of course major spoiler warnings for the entire series we start season 3 in Havana, Cuba of all places, near a, a fishing port, I, I really hope what that's called because I really don't know. But Ben is here speaking fluent Spanish, trying to find the boat from the end of season 2 that found the tail fin of Flight 828. You're probably thinking, oh, word spread fast. Nah, Cal had a calling and drew it, of course. While looking for the boat, Ben has a calling of him making Cal all freaking out because of like a bright light. I don't, I don't really know how to describe this calling, but here, I'll just put the visual up on the screen. But it felt like they were all going to die according to Creepy Cal. But there's another woman with them and the three hop on a FaceTime call to try and figure it out. We cut over to Mick and she's living it up with Zeke on their actual honeymoon because if you remember, he came back to life and beat the death day after they seemed to have defeated Jace and his crew. But now that he's back to life, he can't experience calling so you already know his role was reduced this season. Mick and Zeke's beach house honeymoon is cut short because Mick has to go solve this calling and then we quickly cut over to a scene of a woman in a cell clearly in distress, most likely held against her will. As we catch up with all the characters, we see that Vance and his team set up Zombie with a little minute clinic where their secret base used to be. Remember, she's off the grid because she literally killed the major at the end of season two. I'm off the grid. Ben finally finds the owners of the ship that found the tail fin, and after he flashes them some money, they lead him right to it. And as he touches it, him, Mick, and Cal have another calling, and it's so strong that it shoots Ben back 10 feet. And the whole time this is happening, some nosy little kid sneaks in and gets it on video. During this most recent calling, Cal and Mick were able to get a better look at the other woman that was with them. Cal goes to the board and identifies her as Angelina Meyer, a fellow passenger. Of course, Ben has a file for every single passenger, and her says that she lives in Costa Rica. Conveniently, we're Mick and Zeke are on their honeymoon. Back in Cuba, Ben wakes up and it turns out Vance is with him and is running this whole operation. And of course, right as they are about to make the exchange, the little nosy kid showed the security guard the video of Ben touching the tail fin and he said he wants to watch Ben touch it again. He tries to play it off, but his hand that he touched it with starts literally glowing. Man, I hate that while writing this, I have to cut back and forth from different storylines, but that's just how series are written. So back at the stone house, Creepy Cal says that they need to clean out his room because Ben is going to bring home a visitor. Mick and Zeke are still on the hunt for Angelina in Costa Rica, and her parents said that when she came back, she had lost touch with God, went crazy, and fled. There's another quick scene of Angelina as she is the woman who is locked up, and before it ends, she grabs a knife in desperation. Back with Ben as he tries to talk his way out of this, it goes south and Vance has to step in and take over, but now they have the tail fin and are racing it to the airport to take it home. The Cuban police were alerted and now they're being chased. Vance has to take the fall along with the tail fin in order to get Ben back home, and he is eventually arrested by the Cuban government. Mick and Zeke talk with Angelina's friend and the stories just aren't adding up so they go back and see her parents and Mick has another calling, this time it's Angelina and she's about to slit her wrist with a knife from before. Zeke can tell that Mick is onto something so he fakes passing out while she's going to the bathroom so she can investigate. Turns out Angelina's parents were crazy religious freaks and they have her locked down in the basement and abused her because when she experienced the callings, they thought she was on some devil shit. But Mick and Zeke take her back and Ben swoops him up in the plane from Cuba. They have a nice little welcome back montage and Cal says to Angelina, we've been expecting you. Yeah, as you could guess, she was the visitor. The Major's daughter pulls up to the station about her mother's disappearance and Jared, not knowing who the Major really is, sees it as a normal suspicious case to hop on and the more he looks into it, the worse it is for everybody else. Back at the stone house, Mick and Ben struggle to comprehend how the tail fin of Flight 828 could be in Cuba when they watched the plane blow up right after it initially returned. Ben says that he's had multiple callings of the plane exploding in midair and he's starting to think that the plane did explode and that they died that night in 2013. The idea of resurrection gets brought up and Ben starts talking about the Flight 828 incident in a religious sense. The final scene of this jam-packed episode 1 is Jace and his crew's bodies floating up from the lake because it's now unfrozen and, and this motherfucker Jace wakes up. Like bro, we just added in the fact that the part of the plane was found in the ocean, Angelina is a new character, Jared might fuck everything up for everybody else, and now these dudes are back. Man, I'm telling you, this season is a lot, so each episode I'm gonna have to go into detail about damn near everything. Episode 2 Deadhead starts with Angelina back at the stone house having a calling of her being chased by like an angel of death with peacock wings, I, I guess that's how I would describe it. 
But downstairs someone knocks on the door and it's some agents from the Pentagon looking for Ben. Because they got word of an American plane fleeing Cuban officials and they know that Ben was on that plane, but they don't know who he was working for. But of course, one of the agents was Vance's old partner that helped Ben in the past and knew Vance faked his death. And as he leaves, he tells Ben, the truth shall set you free. Mick finally goes back into office and apparently after what happened with Jace at the end of season two, her job was on the line, but the captain stepped in and put in a good word for her. But now that Mick is back, she's really serious this time and says either follow the rules or quit right now. Mick says she'll follow the rules, which with her, I think anybody would. But she gets footage from somewhere near the lake and it shows Jace and his crew submerging from the water and walking out. News gets back to the Stone family and everybody's freaking out because they know Cal and Mick are the main targets. But they were only dead for 48 days, so they now only have 48 days left until their death date. So Grace has the idea of hiding Cal until they die at her stepbrother's cabin. Mick and Mikami go to investigate the lake where they hear a lady screaming for help and it turns out Jace tied the lady up and her spouse, killed the man, and then left her to die. And she said one of them kept yelling, what month is it? Angelina's call and keeps getting stronger and Olive wants to help her figure it out, but Grace wants everyone to come to the cabin, so now they're split up and only Grace and Cal are going. The rest of the episode is filled out with Grace and Cal making it to her stepbrother's cabin, but first she has to make amends with them. Angelina and Olive follow the calling and it leads them to a photo of Angelina in front of a slushy place. At the same time as Jace, his brother, and Corey are on the run from the cops, they struggle to come to grips with the fact that they died and came back to life. Jace's brother Pete is truly a nice guy at heart and reminds Jace of the olden days when he worked at, you guessed it, the slushy spot. Jace pretends to have a change of heart and drives them back there but actually just wants to rob the place. Earlier Olive and Angelina went to the slushy place and Angelina dropped the picture and when Jace and his crew pulled up, Jace's brother noticed the picture on the ground and he was in the background. He sees it as a sign and stays and gets arrested and Olive and Angelina go back to get the photo and they all find out Jace's brother is enamored with Angelina, thinking this photo means they're meant to be together or something. The other storyline we follow is Ben tries to tell Vance's wife that Vance is held up in a Cuban prison and he gave Ben his wedding ring so he could give it back to his wife. Inscribed on the ring was, the truth shall set you free, that I cannot say it, I've tried it like 10 different times, but that's the same thing that Vance's old partner said to Ben earlier. And that same phrase is written on Vance's gravestone, so he goes there and Vance's partner pal is waiting for him there, and once he hears that Vance is alive and with the tail fin from 828, he's on board with helping with everything. The episode ends with three things glowing, Ben's hand, a sample from his hand that Sanvi took, and then the handprint on the tail fin, all looking like the same glow from the Alzuris' textbook that we've seen multiple times throughout the show. Episode 3 starts off with Vance being interrogated by the US government after they captured him from Cuba, and faking his death for 18 months and going against protocol has them bringing up charging him as a spy. So yeah, he's safe for now, but I'm not sure how much longer we'll have him on the team. Either way, the government now has Flight 828 back on the forefront. Jared is still peeking around about the Major's disappearance and Ben and Mick tell him about the Major faking a zombie's therapist and now he's gonna go suss her out. Great. Just a quick note, Cal sees a peacock in the forest and I'm telling you guys, the mystery of the peacock is very important to the story, but again, we're gonna discuss that later. Ben has a calling of him in like an inventory room and a bunch of items are falling off the shelves and he sees a man passed out in the corner. After this, a page falls off his wall, clearly he was supposed to see it, and it's of a passenger named Egan that had been using photographic memory to wow people, but they assume it's because 828 gave him magical powers. Looks like he's involved in the calling. Mick tries to talk to Jace's brother, but he's too far gone and not budging. But as she leaves, she gets a calling of sorts, because remember how she met that kid who had her dead best friend's heart? Well, her heart starts beating really fast, and she knows that it's Evie trying to talk to her, so she goes to see Evie's parents, and her dad was dead on the floor from a heart attack. Ben goes to meet with Egan and he had the same calling but he didn't see the man on the floor. He convinces Egan to help so it looks like we got a new side character for now but his photographic memory proves to be pretty useful because he remembers every single one of the items that fell in the calling. God I hate that I have to explain this but I guess it matters to the overall story kinda. So remember how TJ went to Egypt to find more clues about Alzuris and Flight 828? Well yeah since the actor that played him clearly got fired or something he's still out there but he sent over some artifacts to Ben's office for Olive to look at. Olive and Angelina head over there and there's this new guy already working on restoring it and you already know him and Olive are going to kiss her some shit and she'll say, ah, I can't do this because TJ, I, I mean, you know how these things go. But on the big piece of paper that they have from Egypt, there's a peacock feather. Man, I'm telling you guys, the peacock, bro. The peacock. But back to the other stuff. So Ben and Egan put it together that the room from the calling was a storage room at a building where rich people keep their stuff hidden and they think that the kid from the calling could have snuck in to avoid the cold. Back over to Mick, her and Zeke are staying at Evie's parents' house to take care of her mom who's suffering hard from dementia. The heartbeats lead her to some old DVDs of Mick and her as kids, but Zeke finds one hidden that says, For Michaela. It was Evie's dad who made a video for when he died, and he gave Mick the house in exchange for all of her help with Evie's mom. 
The guy at Ben's office is helping Olive and Angelina figure out what's on the paper, but there's a piece of it missing, of course. The image they can make out, though, is an Egyptian story of how when people died, they would be judged by a scale to see if they were worthy of going to a higher place. The lady would weigh the person's heart in an ostrich feather, and if the heart was lighter, they passed. Very similar to how Angelina saw the angel of death with a scale in her hand, representing being judged before you go to heaven. So now the religious undertones of the mystery have turned into the possibility that when they came back to life, they are now being judged by God to see if they are worthy. Back with Ben and Egan, they save the kid from the building falling apart, but Egan splits because the cops are on the way. Turns out the kid was a runaway and Ben brings him home, but guess who this kid's older brother is? It's Corey, the guy in Jace's crew. So this calling is deeper than just saving the kid, and these types of callings always give you just a little taste of the bigger picture. We end the episode with Egan actually pawning a bunch of the items he stole from the storage room, and one of them has the missing piece of the Egyptian paper that TJ sent over. I'm telling you, almost every calling is important to the overall story because it always leads further to the actual issue. But Egan also had stolen Ben's bag and ID, and he throws them away along with the piece of missing paper, and Manifest just never makes it easy for these characters. We cut over to Cal at the cabin and he picks up a peacock feather, but one detail I forgot to mention earlier was every now and then Jace and his crew will hear Cal's voice when he's talking and Jace is even more set on killing him and Mick because they think Cal is trying to mind control them. The last scene is Vance's old partner showing him the secret facility with a bunch of workers all dedicated to Flight 828. It's always been a top priority for them, but we now see how important it really is to the US government. Episode 4 starts with Ben feeling like the tail fin is calling him and he needs to go back to see it so he finally gets in contact with Vance and he sends him a car to take him and Zombie to the facility. Turns out the place is called Eureka and they not only have retrieved the tail fin but they also have the burned remains of Flight 828 or at least the one that returned. The other stories that we follow are while Zeke and Mick are staying with Evie's mom Beverly, Zeke has not a calling but for a moment he felt exactly what Beverly was feeling. So it looks like they gave him at least some sort of power to stay relevant this season. Angelina keeps seeing Pete and now there's this obsession brewing because she's in her mid-twenties and has never kissed a boy or had any male affection. Also, the Major's daughter keeps persistently asking Jared about her mother's disappearance. And I'm sure I speak for all of us who watched it when I say this, this girl needs to get her nosy ass up out of here. But most importantly, Jason and his crew have a calling of them running towards a timer counting down and it's almost running out. Right after this, Corey coughs up a bunch of water. Remember, they have a death date too and now it's like a week away because, yeah, they just keep jumping around in time. Mick and Zeke go to talk to Pete because Zeke is living proof that you can survive the death date. Pete is Jace's brother, by the way. I just learned his name now. I don't know if I said it before. But he's convinced and he explains the callings and the big clock that they saw looked like their old high school football stadium. Mick and Zeke go to investigate and in the distance you can see Jace's creepy ass just staring at them. Back with Vance, Ben, and Sanvi, Vance shows them a video of the tailfin disappearing from the facility before it was retrieved by the fishermen in Cuba. The tailfin also had proof of it being submerged in salt water for seven years. Five years from when they disappeared and the two years it's been since they came back. And to add even more on top of this, the night the tailfin vanished in midair from the facility was the same night Zeke survived the death day and then the same night that Sanvi killed the Major. So there's two really big developments in this episode. Well, one that's really big and the other one's just semi-important. So the calling Jason and his crew had led them back to their high school football coach that sold drugs and pinned it on them back in high school. Jace went to go kill him for what he did, but Corey stopped him and got shot in the leg in the process. So now Corey's on the good side and Mick goes to tell Pete all about this and now he's talking and kinda on the good side too. Now, for the real shit. So while at the facility, Ben's hand starts glowing again and it leads him to a secret door and he eventually gets caught and is in a chase and he finds tucked away deep in the facility Kelly, the annoying woman who got shot in season 1, preserved in a big ass glass container. She did die from a gunshot wound to the head, but her autopsy showed her body went through something on par with a mid-air explosion. And her body now has evidence of it being underwater and having the same algae grow on it as the tail fin. Ben is even more on the side of, they died on that plane and were resurrected. Episode 5 starts with Vance's partner covering up the scene from the night the Major was killed by Zombie and he was so damn close to getting caught and having to catch a body. But because someone called a noise complaint in to the cops, it's on record and Jared keeps looking way too deep into it and thinks it's connected, which it is, but still. Mick pulls up to Jace's RV, but he wasn't there. Instead, they found symbols on the wall which looked like they were drawn in blood, along with a drawing of the three shadows from Cal's calling, and then pictures of Mick, Cal, and Ben with their eyes cut out. So Jace is clearly not taking the callings too well, but his burning hatred for the Stone family is insane. Checking in with Angelina, her obsession over Pete keeps growing stronger as she sees him every day in prison to try and figure out the death date. Because I think at this point in the show, they have about like 24 hours left to live. Again, they jump around time a lot in here. But he's moved to Eureka because Vance and the team want to test on him, so he's free from prison, but not really free in general. Mick and Zeke go to meet Corey to ask him about the symbols, and it triggers him to remember a calling where Jace kills Mick. 
So let's just hope that doesn't become a reality. As time keeps running out, Ben makes an agreement with the annoying scientist in Vance that if he can get Pete to agree to the test, he can be free to help Ben stop Jace because he's now on a rampage, nearly killing a woman that lives in Mick's old apartment. This guy hates Mick, bro. Olive takes a picture of the symbols from Jace's RV back to Ben's office with that Levi guy working on the Egyptian paper that I have now learned is called a papyrus. He takes a look at the symbols and starts freaking out because those same symbols are on the 2000 year old papyrus that no one else has seen besides him. So not only do we have the Alzura shit to deep dive into, but there's a whole Egyptian mythology behind what's happening, and also if you've been paying attention to the show, a lot of different cultures mythology are referenced throughout, but there's something special about Egypt. As they clean off more of the paper, they see three men that eerily resemble resemble the three shadows drawn in the center of all the symbols. We know now at this point that those three shadows are Jace, Pete, and Corey, but Levi says this looks like the depiction of the last trial where three prisoners were given a second chance. I'm sure you see the parallel with this and them coming back to life. The first prisoner in the story chose love and was rewarded with a companion, Pete and Angelina. The second chose to get closure on past grievances, Corey. But the third chose vengeance and quote unquote a river of blood was shed, Jace. So this is actually a test for the three of them to get redemption, and I think you can assume what would happen if Jay still chooses vengeance before the time is up. So this whole time, Jared keeps getting closer and closer to finding out the truth about the Major, but Vance's people have had eyes on him, and finally when he gets too close to the fire, Vance's partner pulls up and takes him in to semi-reveal the truth. They make him believe that she was killed by foreign entities and say what we've all wanted to say to Jared this whole time, just stand down. He tells her daughter what he found out, and it looks like we can put this to rest for now, hopefully. Hey, we haven't checked in with Grace, Cal, and Grace's brother in a minute. Let's see what could possibly go wrong. Oh, Grace's brother Tariq wants to open an 828-themed restaurant. While he's talking about it in public, a conspiracy theorist investigator of sorts overhears, follows him back to the cabin, takes pictures of Grace and Cal, and posts about it on a blog website with the title, Local Man Hides 828 Passengers. God damn it, Tariq. The episode ends with Mick and Zeke out in the forest looking for Jace when Zeke trails behind and gets knocked out, presumably by Jace. Episode 6 starts with Jace finding Mick and they fight near a cliff, but as this is happening, Jace starts hearing Cal's voice again saying last chance, but really he's just playing basketball pretending it was the last shot in the fourth quarter. Either way, Mick loses the battle and he kicks her off a cliff, and it looks like a pretty deadly fall if she landed the right way, but I mean, who am I kidding, I know she survived, but now Jace is on the hunt for Cal. Word of Grace and Cal at the cabin gets to the local news and now their cover is completely blown, but Tariq has an underground hiding spot that they used to play at as kids. Some teenagers slashed Tariq's tires and wrote graffiti on the cabin and for some reason this was radioed in to the police and very conveniently Jay steals Mick's cop car and then hears it and gets the exact location. Ben pulls up to the cabin and meets with the family but as they're about to leave Jace gets there at the perfect time. Everyone splits up and runs away after Jay starts shooting but he very quickly runs out of bullets. Tariq runs to the shed by the cabin to get a rifle but Jace finds him and quickly just stabs him. I, I mean it's kind of his fault that he died but it's sad to see Tariq go either way. I kind of like this character. Pete finds Jace though, but there's no stopping him at this point. Grace finds Tariq's body and now she's gone full badass mode and meets up with Ben covered in blood with a rifle and it it's time to save their kids. Totally sidetracking, but one, this is very important and two, this is how they structured the episode. But Olive is back at Ben's office when his book bag is returned and if we remember, Egan took his bag and threw the missing piece of the papyrus in it from the storage unit filled with antiques and then threw the bag away after he pawned the item that he stole. So now this 2000 year old puzzle is complete, but of course we won't know what it answers just yet. Everyone finally has the big meetup, including Corey and Pete, and now the time has finally run up, but at first only Jace dies because, well, he clearly failed the test. But as the episode ends, Olive is cleaning off the last piece, and it reveals that the three are being judged together, so they all have to pass in order to live. And as they come to this realization, Jace turns in a black smoke and engulfs Corey and Pete as they all die in front of everyone. Man, this episode caught like five bodies and we are only halfway done with the season. But now this Jace nonsense is finally over and we can get back to what we really want to know. What's up with the tail fin and everything that they are testing at Eureka?